Good morning and welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 35. Today we have Dean Lewis joining us. He's going to be going through a project that he recently did around Power CLI, where he added a nice GUI interface to some powerful code, and he actually wrote a blog about it. So we'll be doing some interesting things like cloning a VM and setting up some DHCP reservations, things like that. So we're super excited to have Dean presenting here today, so thanks for joining Dean. And with that, I will stop sharing my slides and I'll hand it over to you. Take it away. Hello there, everyone. So thanks very much for taking the time to join today. And thank you, Steve, for inviting me to talk. Um, so actually, this project I did about two years ago, um, and it's taken me two years to blog about it. Um, so that script's been kind of sat there, and the idea and everything that I did was really, really cool, and I learned a lot about PowerShell at the time. Um, and I'm going to take you kind of through some of that today. Um, and the other great thing, I guess, for a lot of people, I don't know what the coding skills are like by the people that have joined already, but I'm not a PowerShell expert. I am still just a, an amateur at this. So I've kind of muddled my way along, learned quite a bit, and then thought I'd share it via a blog post to the world. So... So a quick background, what was the project I was working on? So I was working with a company that provided software as a service environment to their customers. It was a dedicated VMware environment which hosted their three-tier SaaS web application platform. And the need for the script team came out of the fact that they were using an old Unix operating system for the application layer. Um, and one of the very interesting things about that was the OS would actually kernel panic if it detected a new CPU architecture. It just didn't like it. And there was also, because you can imagine, the OS that we were using was very, very old. This was a very, very niche software as a service environment. And um, there was no VMware tool support either. And the solution that I designed also included a DR element. So everyone likes a good visual. So a quick overview of the background and the architecture of this application. It was um, their clients would actually connect over a dedicated VPN link or a direct connection into the data center where this uh, platform was hosted. And then a dedicated connection fail over into the DR platform. We'd use Cloudflare um, as the DNS for the web services so that we could point everyone to the correct web servers. And if for whatever reason, if they hit the second web server in the DR, we just put a redirect on there so it force you over to the, the correct web server. In this environment, typically like any infrastructure services, we have a DNS and DHCP, and we have a firewall sat there as well. The DNS and the DHCP will become a little bit more, um, a little bit, a little bit clearer to everyone in a moment. And then when we get down to the application itself, um, for each customer deployment, we would deploy an application server and a database server. The great thing was the database server could actually be a newer operating system. So for DR purposes, we just used DB replication within MongoDB to replicate between an online database server in production over to DR. But when we came back to this application server, this was the real problematic piece. So here we used um, nimble storage and we used the nimble storage replication to replicate the volume where that application server sat and then we used srm to do the orchestration of failover if we needed it in a dr event so this in presented us with a couple of interesting problems we were unable when we were automating the deployment of the vms at the application level to go in and configure static ip addresses for that particular virtual machine we had to rely on dhcp so we deployed two DHCP servers in, the, um, in, in kind of the infrastructure services area in, the, in these kind of DMZ type areas that we set up. And as part of the deployment, we had to provide a DHCP address to an application server that we know and then replicate that scope and that setting over into the DR environment. Because as you probably know with SRM, only the VMX file gets registered. So the actual virtual machine kind of sits there in a stale state before it's been brought up. And again, because we don't have any options with VMware tools, when we bring that VM up using SRM, we don't have the ability to, on the fly, reconfigure a static IP address. So again, we'd have to rely on DHCP at the DR side to provide the application server a known IP address. Because again, there was security set up on the database servers to only accept 
accept connections from certain IP addresses, i.e. the customer environment they were deployed in, it would only accept requests from the application server from that customer environment. So realistically, the scripting that I'm going to talk about today only focuses on the application level of both sites. And again, when we clone and deploy the virtual machine, we're only deploying it at the production site. And then we're using the nimble storage based replication and the SRM piece to um, take care of the DR on the, the DR site. So just to recap, the goal was the ability to clone a virtual machine. We had to make non-standard configuration changes to the virtual machines. So that was the CPU ID changes to mask the fact that this was running on newer Cisco UCS hardware. So we'd mask it so it would the virtual machine would boot up and think it has an Intel CPU from around the 2007 era. We're not really going to cover that too much in this particular presentation, but if you do want to check out the blog post um, in the links from Steve, then you can kind of see a little bit more detail around that. We need to set up some DHCP res reservations. And then kind of one of the really key things here is the tooling would have to be simple for a developer team to use because I was handing this back off to my customer and they would carry on building their customer environments. And typically the majority of um, the, the people who worked at this business were all developers and they didn't really have a great knowledge or understanding of VMware. So I had to find a way to make it simple for them. So, First and foremost, um, the testing of this. So the solution for me was PowerShell, it, mainly because PowerShell is very versatile. And um, we have the ability to create a GUI, which is what I really wanted for my customers, something they could just kind of click, type into, click clone, and off it goes. Um, we could write error checking and basic uh, checks into that script. And it was also something that I was the most comfortable with. Um, and the other thing as well is PowerShell's free. Um, quite a lot of people that I speak to about this particular solution do ask me why not use something like uh, vRealize Orchestrator at the time. vRealize Orchestrator would have been um, compatible and we could have adapted the, the uh, solution to that. Um, it was just a product that I don't have much skill in um, or didn't at the time for that when that particular project came. So, First and foremost, I had the idea in my head of what I needed to do and what I needed to achieve. I needed to prove it would actually work. So I just created a basic script that would grab my VM, clone it. Um, it was very manual. There was no GUI, but essentially I wanted to find the issues that would come up during these operations, check the handling, and also as well, um, I was building four or five different environments at the time as well. So then I was piping in. Um, you know, from an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file and set into the script. So it was still same very versatile for me. I found some particular unique features of the version of PowerCLI that we used at the time. So in the older version of PowerCLI, the clone command expected the input of a particular host to clone to, and it threw me a nice error every time I'd point it at cluster and hope that DRS would just select a host to deploy the virtual machine onto. So that then meant that in the GUI, I had to give the option of selecting a particular host. And when we edited the, the VMX file in flight, it wasn't possible. We couldn't just kind of do that um, by connecting to the data store through PowerCLI and then editing the, the raw VMX file itself. We had to download that VMX file to the local machine where we'd be running the script, edit the file so we were using regex to do that, and then we'd re-upload it to the data store. Because we were doing this before the virtual machine was first powered on within VMware, it also meant that we didn't need to re-register the, VM, uh, the VMX file within vSphere as well, which was very handy. And then finally, we had to find a way to connect to the DHCP servers, which were sat in this kind of DMZ type area. And that required a WMI configuration because these virtual machines were not on uh, an AD domain. So I've got a little bit of a screenshot for config of that as well. So when um, once I'd kind of proven that the, the theory worked, um, just my basic manual script, and I kind of tested it through and through, um, the next thing was kind of thinking about the GUI. Um, and I had a rough idea of what I was going to do with that GUI. Um, but the first, thing, the first thing that I did was I actually created a flow chart to map out the dependencies, the variables, the flow that I needed to happen. And essentially, you know, it's load the script itself. We need to connect to a vCenter and we need to load details from that vCenter. 
So the details that we need was a virtual machine that we wanted to clone, so that template. We needed a target data store, a target host, the new virtual machine's name, the DHCP configuration that's going to go into production and the configuration that's going to go into DR as well. And then we needed, you know, a nice easy button to say clone that. We need the operation to actually clone based on the, the inputs provided within the GUI form. And then once the virtual machine's created, that's then when we're going to pull the VMX file from the virtual machine itself, insert the CPU ID changes. And then we need to connect also as well to the DHCP servers in the DMZ and set the reservations for them. And then at the end result is a virtual machine which has been fully edited and when we boot it up, it gets from the DHCP the address that we've provisioned for it. The end result kind of looks like this. Um, for me personally, it's, it's quite a simple form. You know, we select the virtual machine, we select the data store, we select this target host, as I mentioned at the time, it needed a, a host rather than a cluster it could be pointed to. I believe when I've tested with the newer power CLI code, now you can point it just at a cluster and it will pick the, the relevant host using DRS instead. Um, we needed, you know, and the other, the other standard things was things like a virtual machine name to deploy from, um, and then the outside of the VMware side of the script was the setting the addresses as well to go to. So a few things to call out. Um, with I use the get VM command to find my template and I use vSphere tagging to identify the particular VMs that I was interested on because there was other templates in this environment, for example, for database servers, um, for, the, for the web front ends, for the DNS as well. So obviously I didn't want those virtual machines returning within this form. I just wanted the application VMs returning in the get data store and um, the output um, I manipulated that to show gigabits free and then I also then added that into the uh, uh, part of the returned value within the form as well so the user could make an educated decision of where best to place the virtual machine realistically um, each uh, set of custom resources went on their own dedicated one provision in the nimble storage so they it was already foretold where that VM would be cloned to, but some. But the reason why I put the show free gig free there as well was so that someone didn't go along and try and deploy a uh, the same VM to the same data store again. So they could see very very quickly if a, if a data store was you know has no gig free on it or very little, then something's already been deployed there, and it may be by mistake. It may be legitimate. And then finally, with the get, because I had to use the get uh, the, the VM host to select to, um, I used the get VM host, and then I also added the memory free to that list. I think like everyone comes across in their life working with vSphere, typically memory resources are exhausted before CPU resources as well. Now I think we've got something in uh, so the question is, with your PowerShell, you can point orchestrate to PowerShell service provider GUI. That way, the customer can use VRO. Um, so the data so can use data store cluster and allow vSense to fit the most free data store in the set. So yeah, so again, all completely valid points. Just in this particular environment, um, there was various things that came up that just meant using VRO um, wasn't possible. Again, the data store cluster is a really good idea, but for this particular environment, we um, we were setting up the SRM replication from either side, and we wanted to keep the cluster resort uh, the customers' resources within the same data stores as well. So we like it to be a, a known entity. So some advice um, to pass on in terms of the PowerShell code. Um, build the code as functions, which you'll see in some screenshots. Comment as you go along, because there were some areas where I did not comment my code, and coming back to this two years later to blog about it, I had to do some Googling to try and figure out what the hell was going in my head at the time when I created that code. Use descriptive variable names. I think just an outing with this slide. Um, use descriptive variable names because you're going to build a lot of form items and then add them into the GUI for when you run it as well. So very, very quickly, it can become quite confusing when you're trying to fix a particular um, item within your form. And test the code individually um, in your flow before you build the GUI as well. I, I wouldn't say build a GUI first and then add your script in. Um, I'd say start with the script and then build the GUI on top. Um, useful things in this code, I mandated which options had to be selected before the code would run as well. It just return, uh, it just wouldn't do anything if you didn't fill out the necessary. Um, and then some oddities that I found doing this as well. 
And um, sometimes the VMX file just wouldn't re-upload for, and it wouldn't throw an error either. It just would not re-upload. And I could not recreate this when I ran it manually or if I piped in the, um, the variables from a CSV file and built lots of VMs. It only happened whenever I ran it using the GUI. Um, and basically what would happen is once the VM had cloned, we'd power it on straight away, the OS had kernel panic, and we'd know that the CPU IDs hadn't been changed. So starting off with building uh, a PowerShell code in a simple form, um, you need to use the system windows forms assembly. Um, so it's just add type, system assembly name. Um, you need to create a new object type to create that form. So it's the windows.forms.forms. And that's really key if you miss that out and you specify all of your objects to go in that form, the form will not start at all. And then also as well, you need to call the show dialog method um, on the object that you've created as well. So within PowerShell, there is an ability when debugging to do show um, and then brackets. And I believe if you do that uh, whilst building the net framework forms code, especially the PowerShell ISE, um, it will actually just hang your PowerShell ISE and you can't do anything as well. So it has to be show dialog. And then finally, and going back to this idea of functions, so you'll see uh, in a moment that my very first function is called pick vCenter. And I use this function to also build the GUI um, itself from scratch and then the first workflow. And then at the very, very end of the script to kick things off, we actually call this very first function, which then obviously launches the GUI code and takes it away. So at the very, very start of the, the PIC vCenter, so what I've highlighted in the yellow there is where we're defining the GUI objects itself. So you can see where I've created the variable name. And then from here, we've got lots of options available. And at the end of the slides, there's a link to Microsoft's website where you can see what all these options are. So I didn't change things like font or text color or anything like that. I just left it really, really simple. Um, but obviously location of where something actually is on the form itself is quite important, the size, um, and then the actual text of the label or how we're inputting particular objects as well. And then we have, we have to use something called controls which then say what happens with the, op the GUI objects that we've created. And typically when you're building the GUI, it's going to be controls.add, and then you're going to pipe in your variable there as well in between the brackets, and that adds the object to the form. And then you can see down here at the bottom, this is where I've built the main form itself and then told it to show that form when we run the code as well. And as you can see here, I've, um, and I never realized this until I was putting the slideshow together, I never, um, I didn't actually build the form in this code until four options down, uh, four lots of variables down even. So kind of that placement doesn't matter too much, but it will matter, for example, if you specify lots of functions first, but don't build you know, the GUI code until you've run all of them functions. You do have to think about that logically building that GUI form itself up front. And then at the very end of my form, I imported the, the modules um, and this, the, the Windows forms assembly. I then built the objects against those assemblies. So basically building the variables, say we're gonna have against this variable, there's a new object of a form and the form type is form, list box, text box. Um, very, very simple in this particular case. And then once all of this is built, we then pick the vCenter and then, then that starts to build the objects against those variables. Um, if you don't specify this, before you pick that first function where you then specify the settings of your GUI objects, uh, you will start to have a lot of failures. Connecting to the servers in my DMZ, um, with DHCP, when you install it on a Windows server, there are no remote PowerShell commands to control the DHCP server. So that meant I had to remotely command uh, uh, command the DHCP server itself. So I used the invoke command PowerShell. And this requires WIMI configuration on the script host server and on the target server as well. So very, very simple with these two lines. You can't append um, IP addresses to the trusted host lists. So you have to specify um, this line every time, even if you're just going to update it with one additional IP address as well. Um, and then finally as well, I've got a, a screenshot of this later on. Um, 
we use in script block the variable um, dollar sign using and then colon and this allows us to pass variables from our main global script into the script that runs locally within the session as well and that was very very key to take the IP addresses which I'm specifying on my local machine where I'm running the script from how do I then pass that that uh, IP address into the um, target server which I'm remote controlling and then finally as well, we had to connect some wiring credentials and these servers weren't on a domain source, so we couldn't do pass-through uh, 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 credentials. So I created a secure password, converted into a secure string my actual password, so you know, VMware one bank here as we like to use in the hands-on labs. Then piped that into uh, an object called my Krebs. And then what I actually did here is I took that variable and I exported it to an XML file. So this XML file now just contains a secure string of random numbers and letters. And I can use that um, XML file as my uh, credentials option when I use the invoke command. Um, hey, real quick. Uh, as far as the credentials file there, when you gave this to your customer, did you essentially have a service account to do this or did every user have their own um, credential file? So because this server was standalone on its own off the network, um, it was just one user that we set up on this server, which then had access to do DHCP locally, because um, bear in mind everything was local authentication on the server as well. And then the XML file itself, you could only run the script from one particular server within the environment. Got it. VMs. So then what we did was we just encrypted that XML file against the local certificate on the Windows server that the script ran from. Awesome. So if, Thank for example, you. Yeah. yeah. So if you just port that XML file and copy it to another server, you wouldn't have been able to open it because you don't have the certificate for uh, encryption. Okay, and then uh, DHCP reservation itself. So uh, with Windows, again, the application expects a MAC address, but without the colons. So again, I just pipe that to a variable and I just use PowerShell to uh, replace the, um, the colon in the, in the existing variable with nothing, which then removed it for me so I could pipe it through into the script block. Okay, so start looking at the code. Some quick check there. I think we've got a question in the chat. Could you have leveraged copy and invoke VM script to achieve something similar there? Um, so Simon, the answer is yes, probably. Um, the, to be honest with you, I was sending four lines of code across to the server. So every time this particular set of code ran, did I really want to copy a, a VM script over every time and make that script more complex to troubleshoot in the future? The answer was no. Um, realistically, this DHCP server was designed in such a way that if it died, we didn't care. We just rebuild it very, very quickly um, because we have a CMB where we kept all of the VM's um, IP addressing and all the rest of it so we could rebuild that DHCP server very quickly if needed. Okay, so looking at the, the lines of code. So really interesting, um, when we add these items into the select down for the vCenter names, so that's the very first action we take, you select the vCenter to connect to, you have to add each item manually. Because if you don't, so for example, typically when you're doing PowerShell, if you want to connect to lots of things or, or define a variable with multiple objects, you could just use the colon. If you do that within your code here, you'll actually find that when you run the GUI script, it will give you an argument error and it'll tell you the argument counts too. And that's because the, um, the add part of the variable there only expects a count of one. So you can see here when I run my script then, I only got a zero uh, results. Hey, uh, I've got something to say, sorry. Um, I've got a yep. similar project I did a while back and I put all of the vCenters in a CSV and then I import them into an array and it makes it a lot easier so that you can reuse that form multiple times for different scripts. Yes. Yeah, so again, it, it makes sense. You know, any uh, one of the things I didn't do here was use enough variables where I could just select my options at the very start of this form. And when I was trying to get this form working again to just demonstrate to you guys, it did become problematic. Um, so it is a that is a good recommendation. Um, and then finally, as well, just to show you what happens if we um, add that item together. So we kind of add it again as if we're going to add the uh, the two items as a single string variable. You can see here it will 
enter and show up within the vSense service uh, drop down box that I created there. But if I click connect on these objects, it's going to try and connect concurrently to both vCenter servers at the same time as well. So it's just kind of one of them little things to watch out for. With button actions, <clears throat> um, here, uh, when I created my button, the first one was obviously connect the I server, which you've seen in the last screenshot. I'm calling my next function once I've connected to the, uh, to connect itself to the vCenter. So here we've got add click on that particular um, GUI object, and then we're calling the function of add vCenter server. And then when we connect this vCenter server, we can see here the next options. And then for me, really simply, the next option is to try the vCenter server from the selected items. So that was the string which we, we chosen. We then, if there's null, the, the uh, connect vSensor function does nothing. And if it's true, um, then the next thing we do is we log the show VMs uh, function. And this is where we start to bring all that data in from uh, VMware, uh, from the vSphere environment. And then finally here, when we've got the clone VM, we've done something very, very similar. But one of the things we've also had to do here is because we've then, um, we've, we're bringing variables across, from the clone VM uh, into the clone VM part of the script, because we can start to use a lot of them. We've also selected the um, GUI objects within this particular part so that those objects can be used here. So, for example, with the list box VMs, we can then say list box VMs dot items, and then we can pipe that to a string. The reason why I've used two string here quite a lot in this particular code was just to remove any characters that may cause problems or cause the code to panic as I'm working along with it. And then making uh, inputs mandatory. So once we brought all of those inputs across uh, in my function, we then basically just put in very, very simply, um, if the length of anything that's been passed through equals zero return, which means the script doesn't go ahead and do anything. And that was very simply to stop someone missing something or causing a problem where they They'd, um, they'd not selected a particular item, click uh, maybe clone, and then it goes off and clones the virtual machine, but because there was no IP address set, for example, the DHCP reservation hasn't been done, and then somebody has to go back and uh, manually uh, enter that in the future. And then passing the parameters into script blocks as I talked earlier. So we can see here I've, um, in, the, in my function, I've defined the DHCP scope variable and that is picking the item from the, the scope box so that was my GUI object and then we need to pass that variable through into the script block itself so you can see here we've got the dollar using colon sign and then we're just calling the variable name itself we don't need to put the dollar in again so what would I change um, going forward? There's probably a lot of things I'd, I'd change, especially working on this code for the last two days and actually even five minutes before we start this webinar. So if it's not working the way it should do at the moment, and I think it might be my lab environment. Um, better error checking for running the code at the moment. Um, as you can see, it's very, very rudimentary. If there was no values entered, it just wouldn't run anything. Um, so there's a, possibly a way to feed that back to the user a validation of success to the user as well, because one of the things that I like to do is I like to hide that uh, the terminal window from showing to the user, they only see a GUI itself. Um, and even outputs to some sort of log file as well. Um, GUI changes, uh, return the progress and error code in the GUI itself. It was just something I couldn't get working at a particular time. Um, and also as well, once I blogged this, someone got in touch with me and they um, actually rewrote this GUI using the Windows presentation framework. So Windows presentation framework is not something I've personally looked to in depth, but I, I've done a quick slide on it as well. So here with, we're talking predominantly about using forms. Forms is based on .NET and is considered the old way of building GUIs, but it's simple to use because of the uh, control method. So control, add a button, add a text box, a list box, how do you specify the, value, the values and so forth. Um, but the performance is quite slow and that's probably something we're going to see in a moment when I run this script. Um, with the uh, WPF, it's based upon the XAML markup language and this is said the new way of doing stuff so you can use a uh, visual studio to design your GUI and uh, then adding your PowerShell code in the back end 
but it is very complex to use. Um, but it, with that complexity, it does bring you the ability to be more extensible with the UI designs. You will see when I load this fall up, it does look like you know you've gone back to the days of Windows 98. And then the final thing, I think one of the things, especially if you building very, very complex scripts, GUIs return a lot of value data that especially needs manipulating as well in flight as it's passed on, then the performance of WPF predominantly is going to be faster as well. So I will move over into the lab environment and I will do some demonstrations. And I think I'm running ahead of time to when I practice this as well, which is good news. So oh, my script overall, I think, is roughly around 300 lines. Um, it just kind of got bigger and bigger as I built more things into it, but the beginning of it was quite small. Um, with the functions, again, you know, you can see here the code. I've tried to keep it as neat as possible. I've tried to comment where possible, and I've also tried to use descriptive variable names where possible. But as you can see here, very, very helpful in my code, I've just called it drop-down list, and that drop-down could be for anything realistically. Um, but again, because it's in as part of the function, at least I can guess it's to do with you know the vCenter part of the function. And if I scroll down, one of the other things that I did when I was testing this code, um, and you'll see a lot of comments at the moment on there, is sometimes as well, I'd use the right host command and I'd use the right host to actually display what was in a variable so that when I was kind of running through and having problems with the GUI part of the code, um, if I run this script now, you'll see that the GUI runs and I can actually see what happens within the terminal window as well. Then the right host will actually display some of the parameters that have been passed through from the environment itself. So very quickly, we've got our setup. Again, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Select the virtual machine, select the data store where I want to go to, select a host in the environment, stick in an IP address, select where we need it to go. Um, and interestingly enough as well, um, on this side here, there should be a label above it, which is called DR, DB address. Um, and actually the location um, pixels overlap slightly with this one here. Um, and that sh means the label just doesn't show in the GUI. Um, and I decided to leave that out rather than fix it with my code, just to show you again, some of the kind of, it's very, very simple to build these forms, but you end up with really odd issues or things that you think, hmm, it's not very, very intuitive. It doesn't move you know, that part along or it doesn't overlap properly, for example. You will notice that with the forms where you're deploying, uh, with building GUI forms. So at the end of my clone script here, I basically just output a message which reads back to the user, the items that they've selected. And again, this was a way for me very easily to tell, um, you know, is there any mal malformation in the data that are sort of the strings that have been passed through to the script itself. But one of the things that doesn't come back at all in the script is the error codes that happen in the background here. So you can see here at the moment, there are some things where I've not filled out everything in the code. So it's telling me now that I've got no values being passed through to the DHCP service, for example. Um, and these just don't show up into the code whatsoever. Now, real quick, is that, a, is that by design? You don't want those to show up in there? Um, so what I would like to do um, going forward if I built this and I carried on working with that particular customer is I would have um, wrote some code in there to catch those errors and then maybe do a write host which writes something very nicely like um, there has been no IP address provided. Sure. Um, because showing, you know, something, you know, showing an exception for this value is null. Again, although it was predominantly developers working with this, they may still not understand what that code is referencing. <clears throat> so when the, um, the developers actually logged on to the server themselves, um, they only had a PowerShell, uh, a shortcut to the PowerShell code. Because again, I wanted to make it really, really simple. So all we were doing with the shortcut here was calling Windows PowerShell as the shortcut. So we're loading Windows PowerShell. Um, we're bypassing the execution policy just in case it got in the way here. And then we're piping it to the particular file to run. So the first time I delivered it to the user, we ended up with this. And again, you're going to notice that this runs, um, it's not 
quite instant. And again, part of that's because it's using .NET framework and it's the older way of doing stuff. We can see here I have the terminal window is sat there in the back, um, which again was kind of handy to begin with at first because we could see what was going on in the environment. But you'll notice as well, I'm trying to move this window and whilst actions are happening and the GUI is waiting for a response, that window becomes uncontrollable within the GUI, which I believe doesn't happen with the WPF um, setup. So we'll build a, another test VM here. Uh, I've actually uh, edited out the need to add in the IP addresses each time for this one. So what I'd also have liked to have done is, it's very handy having the terminal window here because we can actually see the clone operation going on. Um, but one of the things that I believe you just, I could not find a way to do it and I believe it's not available to do is pass that particular information back into uh, the .NET framework form whereas you can do that within uh, WPF. The way you would have to do it in the, dot, in the .NET form is you'd have to catch those progress bars, write maybe uh, write host and write your own messages and then display it back very similar to how I've displayed this message here. But again, very, very handy to actually see that you have errors going on in the background. Um, but once you've really refined things, then what I'd recommend that you'd look at doing is maybe some code at the end of your script like I have here um, and it takes that window which has been built and then the end result once we kind of use all of this code here is, is building it to a console window and do we show console window and here I put zero and the reason for that then is as again thinking about the end user and the complexity we see the console window build because we're loading in the PowerShell modules in the background, but as soon as those have been available and it's built the GUI, it disappears. So the end user will only ever see that GUI, which then becomes a lot more of a cleaner experience. But again, you know, if we have errors or anything like that, if you have no way to display them in the GUI, you may say, you know, we're going to create this third virtual machine here. Um, again, we're going to get that unresponsiveness and if you're the end user, you may not know why. Um, so it is kind of a, a little bit of a bugbear of mind. But the main thing is here, we're going to see the virtual machine gets created, but the VMX uh, changes haven't happened within that VM, and we have nowhere to tell that until we try and power it on again as well. And then we see all of a sudden the, the, the window becomes responsive again. And then just to show you the, the vSend side to kind of wrap it all up, um, you can see here I've built my three VMs. They didn't take long. Um, I purposely used tiny Linux VM, so it, it, the clone operations were quite quick for the demonstrations as well. And that realistically kind of sums it up for everything that I've put together for you guys today. As I said, I am not a, a PowerShell expert in any such way. I'm just kind of a, a, a tinkerer and I had an idea. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of help at the time as well with someone that I worked with who was uh, more open with PowerShell at the time. Hey, Dean, there's a, a question in the Q&A from Chris Halverson. Did you consider HTML when you started looking at writing this script years ago? Um, we did, um, and it came down to two things. Um, I was working in an IT consultancy firm. And there was also that piece for if I'm working on another customer site and this particular customer is trying to deploy VMs and that script doesn't work, who troubleshoots it and who fixes it? And we just kind of, the person I was working with to help me build this PowerShell script between the two of us, we thought that PowerShell was probably the better way to do this um, rather than, you know, try and layer on extra complexity on top of that. All I was meaning was more the uh, where you, instead of using forms, use an HTML window to display this stuff instead of using a uh, forms. That's all. Oh yeah. Um, so again, that just comes down to my ability to code. Um, I looked online at the best way to build a GUI. I read some articles on how to use forms, and I built that form in about 20, 30 minutes, and it worked and it was functional. So I just stuck with that that particular idea. Uh, uh, like I say. I I think nowadays I would go down the WPF route because it's using the XML markup language. Yeah, I would, uh, I would add, I have a customer who's actually going down a very similar path. Um, you know, he's, um, the, the contact there, he's very capable within PowerShell and he likes to live within that world. 
And so they're trying to automate a number of things. And so rather than even use orchestrator or something else, um, he's preferring to use uh, PowerShell. So this is kind of interesting, um, to, you know, just to see and relate to, um, you know, why you picked PowerShell and what you're doing with it. Um, it seems very, it could be more common than we think. Yeah, and again, you know, the, the VRO piece, um, again, you know, part of it, again, comes to my experience two years ago. As a company, we didn't do a lot of this type of thing for our customers. It was very, very niche for this particular customer. The whole reason why it came out, for, it was mainly because we had to change that CPU ID, because otherwise, if we didn't have to do that, we could have just right-clicked, um, you know, clone VM, and someone could have gone to put the IP address in a DHCP server. It doesn't take too long, realistically. Um, the reason why we created that script was because we couldn't and didn't have time to teach the developers how to download the VMX file, how to edit it. And um, the fact that obviously if you, um, for example, leave a carriage return in a VMX file and upload it to VMware, if VMware is not expecting that carriage return within the VMX file, that VM would not boot, it shows corrupted. So there was loads of things around that, that we had to kind of think around what do we do for the end use that's best for them and this was it for us um so yeah it, it worked and like i say the other side of it as well is you we have to support this going forward even though we weren't really going to touch it on a day-to-day -day basis so if someone rang us up said oh your code's not deploying vms today i had to have people on my team who were skilled to look at powershell and then could at least maybe not use the gui but break the powershell down and then run the commands manually to see where it was failing Awesome. Any other questions from anyone or feedback, comment? 